session of the day. Um, and that will be looking at the question of we the people, the future of elections and integrity reform in PNG. Uh, before I go into the panel, I just want to say again to acknowledge those in the room and those joining online. If you are posting about this event on social media, again, a reminder that our hashtag is hashtag PNG Integrity. Um, we thank the European Union for funding um, this summit and also for supporting the work of TIPNG in promoting anti-corruption and integrity strategies. Um, this third panel session is on the topic of uh, elections and elections reform. And we have a distinguished panel that will be joining us. Uh, before I go into introductions on the panel, uh, just to advise again if you keep your phones on silent and to ensure that if you have any objections to your photo being taken, uh, to let the TIPNG team know. Um, there is one apology on our program. So we had uh, Dr. Alphonse Gelu, who is the Secretary for Department of Provincial and Local Level Government Affairs. He is unfortunately unable to join us this evening, um, but we will proceed with the panel and uh, the panelists that we have with us. Uh, firstly, I would like to invite uh, Our uh, first panelist for this important panel is Dr. Thomas Webster. I'd invite him to the stage. As he walks to the stage, I'll just give an introduction. So Dr. Webster is a professorial research fellow and team leader for the Autonomy and Decentralization Research Project at the Papua New Guinea National Research Institute. Uh, from 2004 to 2015, he was also the director of the National Research Institute and was also at one time the commissioner, a commissioner on the Bougainville Referendum Commission. Uh, please make Dr. Webster welcome. Our second panelist for today will be Mr. Anthony Regan um, of the Australian National University. If I could invite you to the front. He's a constitutional lawyer, special, if you could hold your applause until he's seated. He's a constitutional lawyer specializing in constitutional development and conflict resolution, and he has lived and worked in Papua New Guinea for over 15 years. In Papua New Guinea, he advised government on decentralization policy and law. He also taught at the UPNG law faculty and was involved in the Bougainville peace process. So he'll be the second panelist joining us. Please welcome him. Uh, our third panelist um, will be Mr. Peter Aitzi, uh, chairman of TIPNG. So as he makes his way to the front. Um, I, again, hold it. Mr. Aitzi has been chair of TIPNG since 2019, having first joined TIPNG both as a financial member and board director in 1999 at the invitation of and nomination of TIPNG's founding chairman, uh, late Sir Anthony Siaguru. Uh, Mr. Aitzi has served TIPNG in various capacities as a board member and also served as a, uh, from 2008 to 2010 as uh, interim chairman of TIPNG. Please make him welcome. Okay, this is a, a really in-depth discussion, we'll be looking not just at the elections, but really the future of democracy in Papua New Guinea. Um, you'll note outside on the national integrity system uh, that we had pillars outside, there isn't a specific democracy pillar, but they all work on the foundations of democracy. And the national integrity system depends uh, to a large extent on democratic norms in our country. We have recently had the 10 national elections for our country, and it has been an elections, but it's been described um, by observers as being something uh, that has continued the, the trend of deteriorating standards of electoral conduct in our country. The electoral management body is one of the integrity pillars outside, but again, as we've discussed in other panel discussions, there is a national integrity system, so it must work in tandem with law enforcement, with finance, and the other pillars of government, including the legislature, judiciary, and the executive. So while this is a discussion about democracy, it won't be necessarily focused just on the electoral management process, but the integrity system as a whole. Um, having said that, I think it's important at the outset with the panelists that we have to establish a standard of what democracy in Papua New Guinea is supposed to look like. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Webster. When we say that Papua New Guinea is a constitutional democracy, what does that mean and what does that entail? Thank you, uh, Barry, and thank you, uh, TIPNG, for uh, bringing us to this forum and uh, giving me the opportunity to say a few 
what's in insights. Uh, the, the question relating to the, uh, the, what I understand by democracy is that they, at the time of independence, we, you know, before independence, we were on diff living in different tribes, communities right around Papua New Guinea, and we decided to come together and form this nation state of Papua New Guinea. And the way we engage with the, the nation state is through this democratic process of electing our leaders who would then be, take the responsibility for making laws and gov you know, governance of, uh, uh, making laws and governance and making uh, things work for the benefit of the people of our collective well-being as Papua New Guinea. And so the election process is the most critical foundation for democracy, as you point out, as part of being the family of Papua New Guineans, where each citizen, by the electoral laws, the, the organic law on, on uh, elections, provides an opportunity for all citizens and says that all citizens be able to cast a vote so that they can elect a representative. And, and, and that's the time that you feel that you're part of this country, Papua New Guinea, because you've had the privilege of being involved in the election process to elect your leadership to, to come and make laws and uh, run the country. And when this constitutional aspiration of having that democratic process um, was enshrined in, in our national constitution, what were some of the assumptions that went into that process? Or what did we assume about the nature of the nation state that yep. was uh, being brought into effect? I think, and, and, and that's of course also line with some of the conventions of the UN conventions on universal suffrage, where it provides that in terms of the key pillars of democracy or elections, is that you have pers one person, one vote, uh, secret ballot, and, and the opportunity to have an elections. And of course in PNG, one of the good things about the, uh, having elections is that our elections have been held regularly as, uh, as provided. So every five years we've been having elections. Even at some point in time in 2011 and 2022, they're saying of deferring the elections by a year or two, but we've had regular elections. However, the sad point is that we haven't given the opportunity of people to participate in those elections because we haven't done the role properly, the common role. And even when roles were done, people went to the polling booth and the names were not on the roll. So the polling, you know, the, the polling, the polling administration did not allow for individuals to cast their vote. And I think that's a negative effect of, of, of the way we've run the elections. And the, the election observers, both domestic and, and international, have mentioned that in, in a lot of the reports since 2007, 2012, 2017, uh, 20, 2017, and now 2022, we've been denying individuals the right to vote. And, and, and so I think those are the things that really under, undermine the integrity of the electoral process that we have in terms of our democracy. And just to play devil's advocate, so this uh, deterioration that we've seen, was it foreseeable at the time of the formation of the constitution? Did we have incorrect assumptions about the nature of Papua New Guineans? Yeah. I think at the time of independence, the, the role and functions of uh, parliament was clearly understood. And I think at that time they were, you know, that the laws were, make, the function of parliament was to make laws and also to hold the executive government accountable. The two sort of principal uh, functions of uh, the, the parliament in a liberal democracy that we have adopted. Uh, however, over time, and, and at that time, remember, we also have a, had a, a provincial government system that also provided for the delivery of basic services. There were a clear demarcation of functional responsibilities. The national parliament, the national government was about law making and, you know, and, 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 and general policy making, and the provincial government and the local level government for basic service, basic service delivery. However, over time, we've seen the introduction of the 1995, the organic law and provincial government and local level government, where now the, the responsibility for delivery of basic services has been assumed by the members of the national parliament. The, the governors have, uh, have elected as regional members of uh, the uh, provincial seats. They have now assumed as chairs of the provincial government, executive uh, government. The members of parliament, by the, the 2000 introduction of the 2014 District Development Authority, now, now they've taken, assumed the chairs of district development authorities and taking charge of the administration and delivery of services at the district level. So the whole functions of the intent of 
national parliament as lawmakers and uh, as uh, the, uh, the body or the members that would hold the executive government accountable, that traditional role and notion has shifted. And as Richard rightly pointed out this morning and in our discussions in the morning, the role and functions of parliament have changed over time and, and so that's deteriorated to some respect. And so at the same time, on the other hand, their role and in the service delivery functions where the members of parliament are engrossed in has also created sort of the problems for provincial governments that are involved in service delivery. So there's no clear demarcation of responsibilities between provincial governments and national government. And of course, now you throw the other new animal district development authorities. So there's a dysfunction in the way we've organized our government as, because of, as a result of those introduced organic laws and registrations that they've now changed somehow the original intent of the role of national parliament. Thank you, Dr. Webster. That's a clear a diagnostic of the condition of democracy and the, the issues that have led us to where we are at this moment. Before going into maybe the specifics of the 2022 elections and looking beyond it, I'd like to also bring Anthony Regan in on this point. Um, in this analysis of Papua New Guinea's constitution and its democratic principles, uh, was the starting off as good as it could be hoped or were there some issues that we should have foreseen? And how does PNG's constitution in terms of its democratic ideals compare with those in our region or globally? Is it a sound constitutional approach to, more, to democracy? Thanks, uh, Yuan Barry. The constitution started off very well. In many ways, the PNG constitution is an exemplary one. It was made in an exemplary fashion with real consultation with the people it was full of uh, grand vision and um, great hopes, and a lot of optimism. But I think there were a number of forks in the road where the whole thing ran off track. And underlying all of this is what many people would call political economy, which is really about how does politics follow money? Money determines how politics works. In PNG, it's hard to get wealthy except through the state for most people. Some people, so there are some entrepreneurs that have been able to make themselves wealthy through hard work. But a lot of people think that the best way to get rich is through the state and getting hold of bits of the state. And there were three forks along the road where getting control of bits of the state became very important. The first one was with the early slush funds. Uh, the famous uh, transport sector, um, what was it again? The transport sectoral fund set up by Yambaki Okuk. And that gave MPs discretionary money to spend in their electorates. Now initially, it looked terrible. People were shocked. You know, I think it was 50,000 kina or something. It's terrible. They had no idea that that would eventually become DSIP and BSIP of 10 million kina. So slush funds was a big fork in the road. And that opened the way to MPs to manipulate those funds, to spend them in their electorate, in the best way to get elected, spend the money in the areas where they get the votes, or put the money into projects that they then put off to uh, one tox and got bribes from. So all sorts of ways in which that corrupted the system. The second big port in the road came in eight, 1986, when the constitution was amended to do away with the independence of the Public Service Commission and take away the role of the Public Service Commission in terms of making appointments independently into the public service. So very quickly, public service appointment processes became politicised. You could exercise patronage. You could put your one talks, your mates, into jobs. The third big fork in the road was the one that Thomas mentioned earlier, and that's probably been the most dramatic. And that's been the abolition of elected provincial governments and putting governors in charge of the provincial governments. So that means the governor gets not only his or her 
PSIP, 10 million kina, but they get control of a largely appointed government which controls a very large budget, very large public service structures. And so it's now really significant resources that the governor controls. Yes, there are some governors who are totally honest in the way they deal with it, but many of them then use all those resources in ways which enrich themselves, enrich their one talks, or, or both, uh, allows them to spread wealth and spread opportunities in a way that helps them get re-elected. So it's a form of corruption of the process. 2014, because of the jealousy, really, of the open members about the extent of the resources under the control of the provincial members, the regional members, DDAs were established so that open members would have the same kind of control over an essentially appointed body, huge amount of control over discretionary expenditure, contracts and so on, and of course, their DSIP. So why are people prepared to spend 20 or 30 million kina getting elected? It's not because they'll get control of a 10 million DSIP or PSIP, it's because of all the rest of the control that they get. And so, as I say, not every member is corrupt, but there's a huge amount in the system which is open to one form of corruption or another. The importance of being in control of these resources is, I think, the real key to why the electoral system is in trouble because there's now systematic uh, corruption of the electoral system by people who want to get elected to get control of all these resources. So you, if you think your best control measure is over the electoral roll, you try and control that. If you think it's best to stop other people getting nominated, that's what you do. If you think you can control the administration of the polling places, that's what you do. If you think it's best to burn the ballot boxes of the people who are most likely to vote against you, that's what you do. So it's not that the electoral system is, is a bad system, it's that people are willing to step outside of that system and control it and manipulate it. The system works well in some places. I was observing the election in Bougainville for the whole of the election. There, it works well. I was up close to the electoral system for the first time ever. I was really impressed at all the checks and balances there are in the system, if people accept the system. But if you want to step outside the system and control nominations, roles, or whatever is necessary, you think, in your area to get you elected, that's a recipe for the system to unravel. Not that it's a bad system. The electoral system itself is good. It's the incentives people have to step outside the system to get control of DSIP, PSIP, provincial governments and DDAs. So together, all of these things that I'm talking about, these various forks in the road, have led to corrupting influences. And with respect to TI, I absolutely respect TI in looking at the, the integrity system in the laws and in the extent to which those laws are implemented. And TI's assessment in its report last year on the national integrity system shows that the big problem is in implementation. I say the weakness in the TI analysis is that it's not looking closely enough at what it is that's causing the, the break between what's in the law and in the implementation. And to me, it's the political economy. It's the extent to which people want to make themselves wealthy through the state, have huge opportunities if they get control of bits of the state, and so are willing to manipulate everything possible to get into power and then to avoid scrutiny once they're in power. So you have a, to start with your original question, Yombardi, you've got a very good law in your constitution it's remarkable. I've worked on constitutions in a number of places around the world. The Papua New Guinea constitution stands out. It stands out in the region, it stands out internationally. 
In fact, I got taken to Uganda in the 1990s for three years to work on their constitution. Why? Because Ugandan lawyers who'd worked in Papua New Guinea thought there was much to be learnt from Papua New Guinea when they were making their post-conflict constitution. They were interested in the leadership code. They were interested in decentralisation. They were interested in the independence of constitutional office holders, the key things of the PNG constitution. So they're recognised outside. But because of this political economy that's undermining the implementation of the law, we're in a difficult situation. It's a long answer, sorry. Thank you for that uh, detail analysis. I think it's important, and I, I really do want to go into the that diagnosis or maybe where the failings are in 2022, um, but it's important to also establish the groundwork so that the discussion can um, look at where we want it to be, where we're supposed to be, maybe where we are can be the second part of the discussion. And so on that point, I'd like to bring you in, Peter, on, on particularly the standards that we have and maybe specifically the constitutional norms that have been outlined and there were some detours that were mentioned by Anthony in his remarks that have taken us maybe off that path of constitutional norms that we would want to be pertaining to our democracy. What are the risks inherent once you establish new norms that are violating maybe the constitutional principles that were established at the start? Why is it such an onerous problem for advocates, civil society, once new norms are established that may be contradictory to our constitution? I think. Uh, I think, as um, as rightly pointed out um, by both Dr. Webster and and uh, uh, Dr. Regan as well, um, what we've got here is a case of I mean, we've got good laws. We've got an electoral uh, an electoral system which, uh, if allowed to function, I think would would provide us with a better outcome. Um, but um, clearly, yes, I think we've all recognised there is a political dimension to this. And what we've done over the years is we've probably perverted. Uh, our uh, institutional framework or undermined our institutional framework uh, so that it now serves a political outcome or political players. You look at it in terms of, I mean, you can do a, a case study on, on a number of government departments, a number of government agencies, or even programs and projects that have been put together. And where there's a, 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 a political or presence of political uh, interaction or interference, or involvement, significant involvement, uh, you see poor outcomes. Uh, outcomes that are not uh, aimed at serving the public interest, but at individual and self-interest. So clearly that's, I think that's what we need to recognise in this whole exercise. Just so that we're aware of the magnitude of, of the problem. I mean, when we talk about the DSIP, we're talking about 10 million kina that's allocated annually to, in much cases, the, the discretion of one individual. Uh, or in control of one individual, plus other grants that they can draw on as well. When you multiply that by what uh, we have now, 118 members of parliament, that's a, over a billion kina now. A billion kina going through a political process with very opaque reporting, with very opaque decision-making process and no clear, no public access to, to information as to how it's spent other than a very high level budgetary process which is satisfied by putting together fabricated reports in some instances as a way of acquitting those funds. So this is the kind of environment that, 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 we, that, you know, that we need to, uh, that we work within and which we need to address. One of the key tools of addressing that is our elections. And as you look at the, inst uh, the, uh, the integrity systems and, our p and the pillars of, in of the institutions, the electoral system is the primary accountability tool. And unfortunately, that tool, we've taken away its effectiveness. So now we have a system which is not accountable to its people. We've got a system that doesn't bring accountability back to its people. We've got individuals who have influence and significant power matched with resources, who now control that system, and as a result, take away the ability for our citizens to be able to determine what they believe should be those who represent them. And so as a result, you completely undermine the accountability mechanisms within our country. And so I think that's 
something that I know at TI we're very mindful of. And in the work we're doing with the Electoral Commission and the electoral agencies, it's about trying to strengthen that process. And as much as we can, look at perhaps some quick, uh, some areas that can give us a quick, uh, some quick success. And it may well be through uh, groups like Dr Webster and the NRI, is about understanding sort of what we can do with maybe the identification process, the, perhaps the, the way that we, we, we manage the common role, and the way that we are able to use, utilise perhaps a much more effective way for, for our citizens to be able to find themselves in the electoral process and then to be able to exercise their right to vote. So that's sort of some of the key, uh, key sort of observations based on uh, the work of TI and, what, and how we believe we can, we can sort of you know, influence those institutional pillars but also link it back to the electoral process. And um, so when we look at the, I guess the integrity is what you see is what you get and we have a constitution that tells us what we should be seeing and what we're getting is, is falling short of that and there's been an argument put forward by Mr. Regan around um, the political economy and the incentives that we have uh, that destabilize the process. Is that, would you say, the primary factor or are there any other causal factors for the deterioration in the integrity of the elections that maybe we haven't captured in our analysis from your viewpoint as TIPNG? Uh, no, I think that's the, that, that's the core of the problem. I mean, uh, you, you look at it in, um, just in the work we've done in the 2022 elections. Um, six months out to the elections, uh, the appointment of the, of the Chief Electoral Commissioner has, hadn't been done. We get into November, we were advocating for, for some action to be taken so that at least there was leadership within the election, within the, the uh, administration of the elections. That appointment didn't come until the latter half of, uh, of November. Budgets weren't released on time. Now, you know, I think any rightful thinking person would say, if we're serious about the elections and if we're serious about giving our citizens the right to vote in a fair, fair and equitable way, surely we should commit ourselves well and truly ahead to prepare for the elections. Now, if the outcome, but by those that are in power, as perhaps in their views, delaying it, perhaps creating chaos within the process, serves their interest or gives them an advantage, then why wouldn't we do it? Why wouldn't we delay? Why wouldn't we create you know, problems within the election so that we benefit from that outcome? So this is, I think, the, the key issue. It's the political dimension within it which is, which, which is causing us so much problems. And it gets back to the early discussions, I and mean, it's the po political influence across much of what we do within the public space, which is causing a lot of the problems. I mean, I think Ruth made reference to the National Airports Corporation saga that, we've got, that we're going through at the moment. You know, how can one individual be able to have supposedly total control over a, 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 a public entity and not be held accountable? I mean, that suggests that there is a political uh, a patronage or political support for this individual, which allows them to operate above the laws that we are subjected to. And so I know TIPNG has uh, obviously engaged in a lot of electoral work, particularly observation, but I was also pleased to hear that NRI and maybe yourself, uh, Mr. Regan, have views on the conduct of the elections in 2022. So are there any peculiar aspects to this elections, uh, Dr. Webster, that maybe make it stand out from the previous elections, or is it just really more of the same? The question, uh, because I've, com Sorry, I've commented that since the 2007 elections, there were some issues. We worked with the late Andrew Trowan, who was the electoral commissioner, on how, how to improve the common role, the voter ID systems, polling, and in fact, in counting also. A lot of counting processes was taking six weeks and, and prolonged unnecessary extensions. But I remember in 2011, when the Kundiyawa Gambok by-election was held, the votes, the preference votes were put through a, a scanner and put on the overhead projector. The scrutineers came and sat on the side. They saw the votes as they were being said, and, and, and they were satisfied that that was a transparent process. And then the se second and third votes were counted. They, it was finished in one week or so. That process that we piloted was never sort of taken on board and uh, through. And, and why the Electoral Commission chose not to do that and continue with the manual counting that brings a lot of problems into the counting room, I don't know. But what I've seen and what we've seen is that 2007 was pretty good, but it had its problems. 2012, we thought it was the worst one, 
But of course, 2017 was even worse than that. And then the 2022 one uh, was even worse than that. And as I've been pr pr saying and commenting, if we don't do anything about it, PNG is walking to the abyss. Uh, we need to fix the way we run the electoral system. But not only that, we have to also look at the, how to reduce the political economy, the, 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 the rearrangement of our governance system, strengthening the parliament system, strengthening the autonomous government system, separation of powers and functions so that provincial governments are actually delivering the basic services that the members of parliament are trying to do, and let the members of parliament focus on the basic job of making laws and holding the executive government to account through the committee work, through some of the reviews of most of the laws. I know some of you are, well, most of you are lawyers here, but our laws are outdated. There are 1959 laws passed by the Australian government that we've now adapted and we are still using them. The Drug Act, when the pilot brought in the drugs and they were trying to administer, the police were saying, which law do we, uh, law do we charge him under? There wasn't any law, so you had to quickly pass a legislation to do that. Many laws are outdated. So the role of parliament is really to make laws that are relevant to the governing and well-being of the people of Papua New Guinea. They've forgotten that job. Now, through the creation of the District Development Authority and the provincial the PSIP, a lot of attention is being given to that. You listen to the questions on the floor of parliament. It's all about what's happening in my district. There's nothing about what's a nation state. What are the national issues about settlements, land issues, about climate change issues, about cl international negotiations? Who's going to take care of that? Are, are all our members of our leaders going to focus on district and provincial issues? Even cabinet ministers give precedence to their district activities. If they're a minister, they take to, try to take all the, the, the projects that are allocated under the development budget to their district. So we have a, a pretty weak system then uh, that we've allowed over time to, 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 to become like that. And, and we need to really polish up and bring it up to a standard where, where we, we, in my mind, I think we need to review the whole constitution and, and, and saying, where did we start from? How do we, what are the weaknesses? How do we strengthen it and, and try to improve it? Because it is needed. Uh, it's not only about making our electoral system work. It's about the integrity of the individuals that we elect as members of parliament and the office that they hold either in, as members of parliament or as executive government, prime minister, ministers. If you look at the way elections were conducted and you know you can, you know, people got video clips they have, you know, and they were showing how voting was done around the country uh, and you saw some of the violations of the electoral uh, practices and laws that were being conducted, you start to see leaders in a different way. You lose respect for them. And I mean, that's me personally, but I have a feeling that many others. Yeah, so once you start to reduce your respect for the way somebody was elected and comes and you know, becomes a leader, you lose the integrity and, and you know, the, the integrity of the person and also the integrity of the institutions that we represent. And I guess that's really something that I feel if we continue to do that, then it, it's not good for the country and the future of Papua New Guinea. Thank you. And I want to go across to you, uh, Mr. Regan, on that um, and that assessment. Um, would you say that 2022 elections and electoral conduct is markedly different, or is it more of a continuation? And uh, would you support the, the, the calls for a constitutional review? Um, is this one working? Oh, it's working. Um, the election, I think, undoubtedly has got worse, as Thomas says, since 2007. And I think we can go back before 2007. And what happens each time is people find new ways of manipulating the electoral process, of controlling various aspects of the electoral process, which they think will be the best way for them to get into Parliament quickly rather than just rely on the democratic process and the person who will get the highest number of votes. It's not happening everywhere. Bougainville, as I said, the election ran really well. I don't mean there were no problems. There were. There were people complaining about this and that and putting petitions up to uh, presiding officers. 
but all of the problems were dealt with in an absolutely peaceful way and respectful way. People had a, a high degree of trust for the system. People don't trust the system in that way in a lot of places. And the number of places and the number of ways in which people are using to get control of the system locally seem to be growing. That's the, the, the most worrying thing. Sorry, am I not too clear? Um, the, the real issue, I guess, is how you make change. And I don't think the change is going to come through reform of the electoral system. Um, even the problems that uh, my two colleagues have been talking about, the um, late appointment of the electoral commissioner, uh, the, the poor flow of, uh, flow of funds, obviously you need to fix those things up. That adds to the difficulty. But I don't, I don't think they're the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is the pressure on candidates to do whatever is necessary to control the system, to give them what they think is their best hope of getting into office. And that, that lies at the heart of so many problems. The violence, you know, because candidates are willing to manipulate the many unemployed young people in their area to carry out violence on their behalf to help uh, get elected. Some violence happens for other reasons as well, of course. You know, local differences and disputes and so on flow into it. But a very large part of it is due to manipulation of, the, uh, of whatever they can by the candidates. So the big question, I think, is how do you change that? You're saying, would a review of the Constitution help? I'm, I'm not really sure that it would. I think it probably needs more and more pressure from the, the public. In, in European countries, good governance didn't get developed over a generation. It got developed over many, many generations due to pressure from uh, people that wanted certainty in contracts and commercial systems, pressure from local people on um, arbitrary exercise of power by those in power. And I think organisations like TI and many others is what's going to be needed to gradually put a great deal of pressure on the state. There'd be nothing wrong with reviewing the Constitution, but I doubt that the Constitution's really at the heart of the problem. I think, uh, thank you for, for expressing your thoughts so, so clearly and so eloquently. Uh, just to remind those in the room, we'll also be opening the floor for questions in a few minutes. And those watching online, if you do have questions, please feel free to type them um, into the chat box. Uh, I, I note that this panel is not just looking at elections, but also democracy as a whole and the arguments for decentralization and autonomy. And Dr. Webster, in your, in your role within NRI, you examine these questions in depth. So I want to maybe draw that linkage. And um, you mentioned already that you're a proponent of maybe looking at constitutional reform. And so I'd like to see what's your analysis of do poor elections in Papua New Guinea strengthen or weaken the argument uh, for greater political autonomy at the provincial level? Thank you. I'll come to that. I'll start off with the, uh, the constitutional sort of need for change at reviewing the constitution, and then that will then logically flow to the, the question that you're posing in terms of autonomy. The, the whole powers under the organic law are now in the office of the electoral commissioner, a one person. There were some decisions that he made using his powers to declare seats Southern Highlands in 2017, the regional, and then now two seats in the Morbe province using his special powers, and of course, the, power, the Southern Highlands governor's seat again. Uh, and now people might be thinking of how do they now take control in order to now sort of use those special provisions to, 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 to come in through the front door. Those are things that we need to stop, and that's where I think the constant review why is we don't need a one person. We need three, three or five person board to oversee the electoral process. And I, I, the Bonneville Referendum Commission, of which I was a part of, was a very clear and good example of how a board 
oversaw the running of the referendum. And I think part of the review of the Constitution, we need to look at that so that we make sure that that body plans for elections, is able to seek funds from elsewhere, and be able to plan for the elections, appoint people to run the, uh, the as returning officers to run the elections, and deal with many of the issues. The role, common role, uh, the polling and issues, we've talked about them. We've, you know, we've identified ways to do them. But you know, even when CLRC drew up the review of and proposed electoral reforms, the state is not sitting on it. And so that's where I think we need the reforms to, to, to sort of get an, a body that will take responsibility and push for the reforms. I don't think the parliamentary committee in, that was appointed will work out the details. What that body needs to do is work out the details and how to run the elections and make sure that the elections are run. That's one reform that in the constitution that I'd like to see. The other in the Constitution I like is, is basing on the Bonneville, again, the need for a referendum in the country. Where citizens feel that there are laws. We've allowed the laws, when we want to have an issue, we have to go through Parliament for them to pass the necessary laws and changes. And it's only a member of Parliament that can do on the floor of Parliament. Our citizens, we have no opportunity to sort of raise and ensure that the case is brought Parliament. So we should allow for referendums. Where citizens, and enough citizens, I feel that there an issue needs to be brought to the floor of parliament through our representation. That's a form of representation that we want an issue to be brought and, and, and for uh, debate and discussion in the broader Papua New Guinea. We need to allow for that. And I guess that, that's, you know, because some of the things that we want to see, we push for reforms, it gets stuck in parliament because one or two people don't agree to it and it gets stuck. And I think that's an area that we need to look at. But coming back to the issue about autonomy and decentralization. The members of parliament, the district the DA, they're not only getting the 10 million kina that uh, you know, the IHC put them. They're also getting additional operational funds. When COVID hit, I think they got 2 million kina per district. The school fee subsidies for infrastructure, they get a component of that. For health and other purposes, they're getting a bit of that as well. And I've been observing the former Prime Minister Peter O'Neill saying we want a presidential system of government. And I've been seeing now the current Prime Minister Marape saying we want a presidential system. And I'm wondering why they are pushing for a presidential system. Because the members of parliament are pushing for them to allocate increased level of funding from the development budget to the districts so that they can have access to those. So we need a review of it so that we can say, look, what are the strong autonomy governments that we can introduce so that provinces are responsible for basic service delivery. There's nothing wrong about put people pushing for basic services and people voting members of parliament. In the elections, I was observing negotiations between people in the villages and the candidates about what they wanted the candidate to do. And the candidate would promise and say, we want to fix, to fix this road, build these classrooms, and do these things, and we will give you our first vote. So if the, there was an agreement between the candidate and the people, the people agreed to the first vote, they would do the block vote. And many observers, they said they're about block vote, the people are not being silly. They are being smart about how they can, because they know that their one vote will not be able to give them the bargaining power with the member of parliament for the DSIP funds to provide basic services. So as a collective body, as a clan or as a village, they have more bargaining power with the member of parliament. And so they do a block vote. So there's one individual person who wants to go and vote, they say no, the village leaders or they say we will do a block vote and we have to demonstrate and show to the candidate that we have done so. So there's no secret ballot. They get some people to fill, and then they put, display it and put it into the box. So it corrupts the whole practice of the electoral processes that we want to strengthen under the universal rules, democratic principles of one person, one vote, secret ballot, and so forth. So that's why I think we need to look at strengthening the provincial government systems, giving them the powers and functions to deliver basic services like health, education, look after rural roads, and all the things that the members of parliament and provincial governments and what we want. 
let the national parliament focus on lawmaking and holding the executive government to account as we are, you know, as the traditional roles of members of the legislature in a liberal democratic system that Westminster system that we've adopted. So that's why I feel that it's important we need to introduce, uh, reintroduce strong elected provincial government systems or autonomous uh, bodies, give them ample power, strengthen them so that they can operate independently. Thank you. I think before I come to the floor for questions to our panelists, and if you do have questions, I'd ask that you direct them uh, to a specific speaker and to ask a question and not so much to make a statement. I'd like to just continue that line of thinking with a question to you, uh, Mr. Regan. The Bougainvillean experience, and you say you're looking at the Bougainville elections. Were Bougainvilleans looking at the conduct of the 2022 elections and comparing it to the 2019 referendum and saying, look, I'm being shortchanged here. This is not the kind of democratic process I'd like. Was it something that came up uh, as, a, as a point of contention? democracy under the Bougainville referendum process, democracy under the PNG elections, or was it not an issue at all and they were happy with the, with the standard of elections that they had in either case? Yeah, thanks, Your Um Undoubtedly in Bougainville there was a lot of discussion in the areas that I went to. I, I visited about 12 uh, polling stations and uh, went to a lot of counting, uh, long periods of the counting. So I talked to a lot of people. Um, when there was those people chasing one another with bush knives on the streets in Port Moresby, the video was all over everybody's phones in Bougainville. And lots of people were looking at it and saying, we don't want to be a part of that. So it, it certainly has an impact. And no question. But to come to the point that um, Thomas was making, I agree with the particular reforms that Thomas is talking about. Um, the Bougainville Referendum Commission and the way the Bougainville Referendum was run offers a lot of good lessons for possibly looking at reforms in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Referendum Commission, headed by a highly independent person and made up of, a, of three each from Papua New Guinea and Bougainville, the two electoral commissioners and then two other appointed by each government. They, they worked really well together, although they were coming from, uh, in a sense, different sides of the situation. Um, and being under an independent, highly respected chair, uh, nobody questioned the decisions of the Commission, but there were a, a few other things as well. Um, funding. Now, funding didn't flow as well as it should have, but in the end, the funding was there um, well before the referendum. Um, very good personnel the, working for the Commission. That was a very effective electoral manager, and then under him, there was good people from both the Bougainville Electoral Commission and the PNGEC, and they were supported by people from the UNDP, from IFES, from the Australian Electoral Commission, from the New Zealand Electoral Commission. And they worked really effectively together. Uh, they used local resources. Bougainville had established a system of community governments in 2016. Each of the 47 community governments had um, between 8 and 15 <coughs> wards, which meant that a ward is quite a small population, just three or 400 people. Each ward has a ward recorder. The ward recorders were the people that did all of the work in putting together the electoral roll, and the electoral roll went back and forth between the commission and the ward recorders for checking, so that by the time the the vote was held, the role was really good, really effective. There was only a tiny proportion of people who weren't able to find their names on the rolls. Uh, so um, another important point was very strong popular awareness. There'd been a huge amount of awareness about the referendum for the two years before it. So two years out, people didn't know what a referendum was, they didn't know what the question would be, they were confused. By the time the referendum was held, people knew what a referendum was, knew what the questions were. Um, so all of these things together, 
operated to make it a highly, a really well-run referendum with 87% turnout on a really accurate roll. Now, normal election in Bougainville is about a 60% turnout on a very poor roll. So it means you know, it was a remarkable outcome. So there are things you can do, both through law and through administration, to improve things. Uh, but they're very hard to make stick in Papua New Guinea if this political economy continues. That's why I say the key in the long term is changing the political economy. And that's going to come through pressure from the people, getting fed up with the way it works. It's, you can't legislate or administer uh, the, the existing political economy out of existence. Thank you. I think um, we've had a very thorough and wide-ranging discussion on our, on our prompt for the panel. And um, just to remind you before we open for questions, that this panel is looking at We the People, the future and elections, future of elections and integrity reform. And specifically in the aftermath of the 2022 national general election, this panel is discussing the lessons that need to be learned to preserve the integrity pillars for democracy in Papua New Guinea. So I'll open the floor to questions. Um, if you do have a question, if you could raise your hand and a mic will be brought to you. And I ask that you state your name and the organization that you are engaged with. I see one here. And Thanks. Uh, very, very uh, interesting presentations. Um, as you highlight, yes, political economy very much at the core of it. One of the big challenges is how do you actually roll the clock back? You know, over the years, for example, on DSIP, we've had in CIMC forums, all the community members say, we don't want this, this isn't working. But of course, the members are using those funds. How do you get them to actually take a step back? And you've been talking about the members, but the other side is also the government. How does a government form, and what is the glue that holds it together? Maybe nearer independence, some of those parties actually had a bit more of an ideological basis. But bit by bit, I mean, really all the parties are pretty well the same in terms of you know, the aim is to be in power and gain power and hold. Um, so McCary tried a technique of, with the integrity of political parties and candidates to create a bond between, but of course it was constrained, including by decisions about, uh, from the Supreme Court. But someone has been driving some of these things. Someone has decided, look, we're going to let them have, the members have 10 million because that is a, one of the methods for creating glue, giving you as many, having as many ministries as possible. I mean, I think uh, late Sir Anthony said back in the 1980s, we shouldn't have more than eight cabinet ministries. But now we're, what, 32 or something. Um, how do you actually change the direction. As you say, I think a lot of it is probably getting the public awareness and certainly in this election you're hearing a lot of people expressing this is the limit. Um, some, some of them expressed it rather forcefully in the electorates. But yeah, that, it's a big challenge. How do you unwind the mechanism that has actually been partially, maybe stumbling ahead, but partially purposely created to enable certain people to, to gain and control power and, and to be able to keep office for an extended period of time. It's very hard to wind it back because people have got so much to gain. So reform coming from the parliament is, is going to be difficult. Um, Thomas is talking about autonomy and uh, elected provincial governments. Well, there were detailed recommendations from the CLRC for that very thing made in 2015. Um, nobody wants it. Why? Well, because it's much more 
beneficial for the current members uh, to be governors and heads of DDAs. So it's a, it's a real struggle. That's only going to change if there's real strong political pressure. Um, it would be better if the, some of the political pressure could come through parties. But you know, the, the TI National Integrity System report last year answered the question as to whether parties aggregate interests and said, no, they don't. And it's true, they don't. Uh, Olipac didn't uh, run, didn't achieve the expected outcome of strengthening parties, not only because the Supreme Court um, put it down, but some of the main provisions are still there. But it's resulted, if you actually look at what happened with Olipac, instead of getting a smaller number of uh, large parties, there's a larger number of small parties. You know, it's, it's, all, it's exactly the opposite of what was intended because there are no aggregating interests. You know, the parties in, in Australia are terrible in many, many ways, but they do, to some extent, aggregate interests. Labor Party does tend to represent the working people and the small people. The Liberal Party does tend to represent economic interests of the wealthy. The Greens uh, recognize, are representing a, a, a constituency of people committed to doing something about climate change and environmental damage. And so you can, you can get into Parliament without wealth because the party gets you in. So there's all sorts of things that work to make the parties aggregate interests and to reduce the kind of corruption that unfortunately operates in PNG. Undoing that is going to be hard because of the interests of the people in power. So that I think that seriously the long-term best is going to come from popular movement and of course every possible effort to make change. Because every possible effort to make change, every now and again one of them is going to succeed and struggling each time for the, the right sort of change is going to raise people's consciousness slowly, slowly. So I would support <laughs> Thomas in all of the reforms he's talking about. They would be good changes. I doubt they'll achieve them a great deal in the short term, but they will contribute to making things better, even just by trying to raise debate about doing things better. Thank you. I think we had one more question at the back. Um, so. Testing. Yep. So thank you. I'm just gonna go straight to the question. Um, yeah, sorry, the, your name and organisation. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Brian. Brian Earls. I'm with Amstrad Holdings Limited, but I'll be speaking from a personal point of view. Sure. Uh, the panel itself is we are the people, and election process is the people. So my question is basically your all opinions on the panel. Do you believe that the requirements of democracy is being met and are we abiding to it? And have we lost sight of what democracy is really all about? That would be my question to all of you. Uh, well, I think, young man, we definitely have lost sight of what democracy should be. Um, just based on the experience of, the, of as, as recounted by uh, Dr. Webster, um, over the up 20 years now, we've, we've eroded uh, what should be the, the democratic principles that should be uh, demonstrated in our elections. Uh, we have disenfranchised large, group, large sections of our community because they no longer can participate. Whether that, by ver uh, comes, uh, that lack of participation comes via uh, an omission from the electoral roll or, or the polling roll, or by virtue of them not being able to actually physically uh, cast their vote at the polling site. And then on the, 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 the other component of it is if, and if by chance they do, they're fortunate enough to cast their vote, the way that the, uh, the, count, uh, the, the, the counting of the votes is conducted at the moment gives them no confidence that their vote is actually reflected in the result. So in, in answer to your question, no, I, I, we've lost sight of, of what should be the democratic principles enshrined within our, election, within our elections and, I, and we do a disservice to our citizens. 
think similar views have been expressed by the panel, so I'll, in the interest of time, open the floor again. If there's another pressing question from anyone, there's one in the back there, I've noticed. All right. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Nigel. I'm from uh, the PNGFM newsroom. Um, my question is directed to Mr. Regan. Um, you stated that you don't believe in the reform of the electoral system, which I will agree to as well. But do you think there should be certain tweaks done to the processes? For example, um, you established that people are finding new ways of manipulating the electoral processes. Um, you also maintain that pressure on candidates to control the system is one of the core parts in the heart of the problem in our elections based on the disaster in July this year. Um, in your own opinion, do you believe we should introduce a criteria for candidates? And could you um, state some advantages and disadvantages for it? Criteria for candidates. So you're, you're suggesting educational and other criteria? Is that what you're meaning? Um, yeah. if, you, if you could just explain when you yeah. say criteria, what are the things that you would like? Criteria such as um, the level of education that they've achieved, um, the, their experience in a certain, um, in a certain trade or uh, sector in, uh, yeah. Um, I, I hear that talked about in a lot of places. It's being talked about in Bougainville too, about their government. Um, the difficulty is, I think, or the number of difficulties. One is that I doubt education's the issue. Um, overall, the education level in the PNG Parliament has been rising steadily. It's a, it's a fairly well-educated Parliament. Uh, so I doubt education's a problem. But then if you start going into other kinds of criteria, like contributions to the society or whatever, it becomes incredibly subjective and I suspect would be manipulated and twisted. And more fundamentally even, you've got a constitution with very good system of rights and freedoms. One of the rights is the right to stand for and get elect and vote in elections. So if you start qualifying that right heavily, you, you get into a lot of difficulty. So I, I understand why you're saying it. I, I know lots of people are saying it and thinking that the real problem is in the qualifications of members. But I think the real problem is much more about the political and economic pressures on candidates, no matter how well qualified they are. Okay, thank you. And we have a question in the middle there. Um, <coughs> maybe I, I, have a, I have two questions. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm a, a individual social advocate for persons with disability. Um, I use CIMC a platform to advocate. Uh, yeah, I've got two questions. Um, the first is on integrity. Uh, the, is on the integrity of the elections. Um, uh, in line with Mr. Uh, Anthony. Uh, Anthony Regan's um, comment uh, on the political pressure, and uh, the question is, yeah, the question is, um, what is the importance of a politicians or the head of the political parties to also try and advocate to to minimise the political pressures by having a having their own political party? To operate as an organisation, uh, with and also you know uh, yeah to operate as an organisation and with with and with effective programmes where you can be able to um, empower and you know utilise 
people to become the part of the program of that specific political party and then participate, participate meaningfully uh, when it comes to the, um, the integrity of the elections and uh, the integrity of political parties and even the, the, the individual integrity of the, power of the politicians. So I don't know how important it is to you. And if there is some legal person um, at the panel, or like if maybe Dr. Webster can answer this, um, is there like is there any law within that integrity of political party that can be able, that 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 allows uh, um, a, 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 a political party? Uh, with a constitution that said to said about having uh, the political party operate as an organization and 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 also to with it, with its programs to to empower and even to utilize people and you know make them people uh, participate in safe conversation. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for those uh, questions from Jerry. So I think the first one was on political parties' role in promoting integrity in the elections, either in the candidates themselves or in the supporters in the electoral process. How important is that in your analysis of the issues that we faced in the elections? And then secondly, are uh, there requirements on parties in terms of their composition and their um, requirements to engage with their membership base or with other peoples in terms of their programs or work? What are the um, requirements on political parties and are they adequate um, as we see them? So I think those are twin questions and uh, looking at political parties and I'm also mindful that uh, Mr. Aitzi and Dr. Webster could also contribute to this question on political parties' role in the elections, I think the most recent one, but mostly also their role in terms of society and engagement uh, with the broader population. Uh, so to you first, uh, Mr. Regan. Um, on the question of political parties, under the OLIPAC law, political parties to, to be established have to get signatures, I can't forget the number, but it's some thousands of signatures. They're not allowed to be secessionist, um, which I think was probably introduced because of Bougainville when OLIPAC was being passed. Um, but there's not a great deal more of detail, it was really left to what parties might stand for. It was hoped that the incentives given to parties to get established would see them representing wide interests. Um, so, sorry, what were the other? Yeah, just uh, the programs of work, parties engaging with society, are there any uh, requirements for them to do that? No, there's no requirements for, for parties to engage with the the public, it's just assumed that if they've got a broad membership base that they they will. Um, s s most of the parties are not very well administered or run. The vast majority of them are tiny. They, they'll have, there's, there's been an average of 40 to 50 parties per election since OLIPAC was passed. Um, if you actually go through the names of the parties, they've changed. It's, you know, Pangu and um, you, you know, the different major parties have remained steady, but there's been a constant flow of, of parties ever since. Um, and they, m most of them don't have any real grassroots base. Okay, thank you for that uh, the question and the response. Uh, and I'm, I'm mindful that we're slightly over time, um, but it is the last uh, panel on the second day of the second National Integrity Summit. So uh, if there is a last pressing question, I'm happy to take it uh, before we ask our panelists for closing thoughts. Okay, there's one in front here. Thank you, panel, uh, for, for the insightful discussion. Uh, very helpful. Um, my name is Joseph uh, from The Voice Inc., so a civil society organization. Um, I, 
I, I, I mean, I, I'm getting the sense that, I mean, from the outcome of the discussions around the importance of bringing the people, uh, or involving them in the conversation, because I think, you know, the quality of our democracy rests a, a, a lot on how educated, or how involved, or informed our our people are, or the constitutions are, to demand and enforce those changes. Um, so I was just hoping to hear um, a, a bit more about, you know, some avenues that um, how people can be engaged in the process. And I'm glad that you know there was a question around the political party uh, involving the people. Uh, this uh, also the referendum process. Maybe the it's probably difficult. But maybe from your experience as well, um, maybe throughout the country, uh, instances where uh, people have been effectively, you know, engaged to force reform, um, so that you know, people in the civil society space would be interested in in how we can, uh, you know, advocate for some of those uh, or engage the people productively to you know bring reform. So, any thoughts on that? That's to all the panelists. Perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll start. Um, Joseph, it's a good point and, and one that TI works very hard, uh, very um, uh, closely to, de to develop. Um, at each consecutive elections, uh, we've had a number of uh, civil society groups uh, and uh, NGOs uh, who have uh, assisted in electoral awareness and um, they've, they've gone out and, and conducted workshops, trainings, uh, and just awareness sessions are, uh, in various communities to uh, be able to assist their communities better understand the process of the elections, but also uh, understand the value of the elections and how they participate in them. Um, so that work needs to be continued, continually supported uh, with uh, materials, communications materials, but also just an understanding of the environment that the elections are delivered in so that people are also aware of some of the uh, the political inherent risks that come with elections and, and, and how their participation is in, in some way determined by, uh, you know, perhaps those in power so that they can better respond to that when they, when they go to the elections. Um, so that's one aspect of it. I think from, uh, if we are to take forward some of the discussions that we've spoken about today, uh, I think the community is a key component of it. And by the community, I mean, when we talk about individuals, um, individuals are, are grouped in different, or find themselves in different groups. So we start with our, obviously our family base and then we go to our clan. But you think about it in terms of how you, in, it, how you would bring about and mobilize major sort of change on a public base. And that's through the various uh, organizations that we get involved in. Large church groups is a starting point where you've got uh, congregations that can be up to 100,000, 2 million for the Catholic Church, for instance. And you start to look at the work of uh, the groups like Caritas in that. You look at the works of, work of, the, uh, of the, Catholic, the various arms of the Catholic Church in the way that they advocate citizen participation within the elect election process. So they uh, provide you with, a, a, in a way, an organised uh, uh, organized structures, organised uh, entities that you can uh, be able to partner with in order for you to start to multiply uh, the information that gets to the community. Um, so that's one way that we, would, that we at TI would, would work very closely. In, t uh, in terms of communications and uh, informing the, and, and, and mobilizing popular support, I think that's critical to any, any reforms then. But the information, you know, you need to provide ample information for people to understand and then to uh, improve in the level of discussions and engagement they're involved in. Uh, I think the elections, I mean, despite people, candidates standing for political parties, it's not just about the candidate. Uh, when you look at our, I mean, I might be coming from the Highlands region, but I think that it's across the country as well where the members of parliament are covering a wide region. And they have a, you know, they might be coming from one particular area in the, in the district. The other areas in the district, the ethnic groups, the villages, they have their own candidates. They want a share of the pie. And so they mount their candidates and they, 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 they you know, and, and all they can understand is we want to 
win and be you know uh, be part of the, uh, the decision making and sharing the the district development grants and be able to make decisions about who gets services and so on because if you look at some of the, let me give an example i won't name the electorate but the electorate is in three parts the east central and west if the member of parliament comes from in the eastern half of the electorate and this base vote Primarily, the first preference vote, you might be getting about 50% and then a few from the middle region and a few from the... His or her focus is going to focus on supporting and bringing services and goodies for the place where he comes from, to the behest of the other areas. And so they're going to now conspire and plan to win the next election, mount their own candidate and so on. So it's about who controls it, and that's exactly what. And the MPs... The members of parliament who are in office now, they use the state instrument to cement their positions. They appoint the district administrators, they negotiate and get the returning officers appointed to the electorate, and then the returning officer that appoints the polling officials and the police, who have, they provide the vehicles through the, through the DSIP funds, and the other public servants they've been working through. <coughs> they use the state instruments to control the whole electoral process. And I think that's the risk that we need to sort of highlight to people and say, look, we, and my, my point is, we need to remove that DSIP and the MPs engagement at the district level. And I take Paul's point. It's something that we can't wind back the clock, but we can still provide grants that you can go and give it to a church or give it to another body and you know, let them implement, but don't tie it to the district. Disengage and give the provincial governments clear mandates and responsibilities for certain functions. But we need to inform the electorate that the current system is not working. It won't deliver the goods and services because the electorate is unfairly represented in decision making. And the national level, the law making functions and the, the accountable mechanism is not working. So both areas are not functioning properly and we need a review. And I think that's the sort of discussions that we need to elevate and, and push for mobile, popular sort of conversations to ch call for change. Thank you so much, Dr. Epstein. I think that's the, the right point to end on. This was a panel looking at, yes, the, the, the issues that we faced and some of the, the constitutional pluses that we have and some of the erosion of constitutional norms that we experienced. But it was really a panel looking at reforms that could be introduced. We had um, the highest of reforms, I think, looking at constitutional change. Um, there was also some discussion about what that would entail. There's also a bit of uh, distrust about who would take carriage of that uh, process. Um, but there are definitely some glimmers of hope. We heard about um, some of the detours that we took when we had decisions around decision making and the expenses uh, of p political uh, economy impacting decision making and democracy in Papua New Guinea. So there were some de definite decisions that we took that took us onto a path that we are where we are at now, where we feel that the democracy that we have is not meeting the standards that we had outlined in our constitution. Having said that, there are glimmers of hope, and we've looked at, uh, for instance, in the Bougainville referendum, there were clear, clear advocacy and planning and administrative and decision-making processes, uh, notably with the composition of the commissioners, uh, but also the engagement with the structures that were there in the wards, the communities, and civil society to educate and inform citizens of a process. Uh, there are other processes that we've recommended as well, looking at uh, referendums as a way of engagement, political party reform, and obviously the role of civil society in, in bringing that together. So I think it's been a, a very a thoroughly enjoyable discussion, very in-depth, but also very engaged and accessible. So I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our esteemed panelists for taking us through that panel. Thank you so much. I'll ask the panelists to stay on stage for a panel photo and then ask Aaron to come up uh, with closing remarks for this session. Maybe could you stand for the rest of the photo?
Okay. Okay, we'll just give another round of applause to the final panel uh, for the second National Integrity Summit. So I first start by thanking each and every one of you who has attended uh, this summit over the last two days in person and online. There have been critical questions asked, concerns expressed, and an even greater push by all our panelists for the need for us to work together. During the keynote address, our keynote speaker this morning, Mr. Dirk Wagner, spoke to the work that UNDP is doing in the area of good governance. He touched a little on the UN Convention Against Corruption and specifically the support that the UNDP is providing to our, gov to our country's implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Plan of Action. For those who have uh, not been able to view this document, it is available online, the National Anti-Corruption Plan of Action, and outlines our government's plans uh, to address corruption in Papua New Guinea over the next five years. The roundtable discussions really gave us an opportunity to hear from our five MOU partners about the challenges and lessons learned in the last few months of working on developing their own uh, customized in internal anti-corruption and integrity strategies. We heard from the interim ICAC office. Mr. Elu joined us online via Zoom from Sydney. We heard from the secretary of the National Judicial Staff Services, uh, Mr. Jack Carrico. We heard from the secretary of the Public Services Commission, Mr. Terence Tupi, the deputy secretary for the Constitutional Law Reform Commission, Commission uh, Dorothy Kesenga, and of course the Chairman and CEO of the National Economic and Fiscal Commission. Key points from this discussion was not just the process being important, but also the people that are involved in carrying out these processes. They also stressed that it's also about doing the little things right. All five organizations want to ensure that their own staff within their own organization are doing the right thing, are following processes, and are carrying out their mandated functions. As we heard, three agencies have launched their anti-corruption and integrity strategies, and the last two agencies are on track to launch soon. Panel one this morning looked at the question around what expectations of accountability the public should have of constitutional offices. Some of the key points highlighted during this panel included individuals carrying out their work independently, and importantly, ind the independence coming with responsibility. It was clear that the threats to independence of a constitutional office are particularly around funding, appointments, and improper outside influence. We heard from Ruth that civil society and the media play an important role in asking the right questions, in demanding explanations on decisions that are made by the, those in public office. An important point raised was around entrusted power, power that is given to you. Importantly, holding public office means that all decisions will be scrutinized. The panel agreed that we need to be proactive in sharing information with the public. If you are doing your job, then there really is nothing to hide. Just as yesterday, the question around how Papua New Guineans see ourselves, what we say and what we think, of ourselves is so important. Again, the need for partnership, the need for collaboration, and that truthfully, there is a lot more work to do, or a lot more work that needs to be done in PNG across government, private sector, and society at large. We just heard a very big discussion on something uh, that has really uh, challenged us as a country, and that's on our elections and of course the electoral integrity reforms. Our panelists shared sentiments about how challenging the elections were in 2022, but there was a lot of concern expressed about the deterioration over time and really an increase in people being unable to exercise their right uh, to vote in elections over uh, the last number of years. 
There were discussions around the review of laws, reviewing the constitution, but also considering that there needs to be greater pressure, particularly public pressure. It's clear from the panels over the last two days that in order to bridge the integrity gap, we have to work together in partnership and in collaboration. We really need to get rid of the silos that exist, not just in working together, but importantly, sharing information. Panelists yesterday and today expressed strongly that international partners, development partners, and donor partners need a more coordinated approach, need to also be accountable to the public about their support to Papua New Guinea. Separation of powers, separation of functions over the last two days was another common theme. It was discussed critically during the panel on private sector and public money, and again during the panel on the expectations that the public should have of constitutional officers. So where to now? TIPNG will be issuing an outcome document from the panel discussions held over the last two days and make this publicly available to better inform donors of the way forward to support good governance in PNG, to update the government on avenues on increasing integrity, and to guide the work that we all need to do to bridge the integrity gap. In closing, I thank each and every one of you present here today and virtually for your commitment to the two-day summit. I thank our guest speakers, panelists, and of course our excellent moderators, Martin Brash and Yuan Bari. I extend gratitude to the European Union for their support uh, to the work of Transparency International, but also to the work of good governance in Papua New Guinea. I thank particularly our five MOU partners for sharing their own experiences this morning. And I can say proudly that during the uh, morning tea break, there was an exchange of discussion around other agencies uh, wanting to now develop their own internal anti-corruption strategies. I thank our colleagues from the media, particularly the president of the Media Council of PNG, Mr. Neville Choi, Dylan Murray of The National, and Nigel Mado of PNG FM for spending the two full days here at the summit with us. I thank our constitutional officers, departments, agencies for also taking time out over the last two days to be here. I want to also thank some of our suppliers, so just quickly, Tapioca Delight for the catering provided over the last two days, Spider Tech PNG, for their support that they've provided, not just for this summit, but our first summit last year in ensuring our sound and light, lighting here at the venue, as well as enabling participants to join virtually. I thank the board of TIPNG for their strategic guidance provided to allow our team at TIPNG to deliver this important event. Lastly, to my own team, uh, of course, the leadership team, you are and Yvonne, uh, Elizabeth, Daira, Barbara, Kalia, Semi, Lumen, uh, Hezron, and of course our legal interns, Mariah, Courtney, uh, and George, and our accounting intern, Rodney, um, for all their support in making this event possible. And of course, um, the last member of our staff, uh, the, the last few members of our staff, Alexandra, who recently joined us, as well as the team at the office uh, today, uh, which is Richard and Jenny. Um, so I thank you all once again for your support, your commitment. This is not the end. This is really the start of what we need to do to strengthen integrity in Papua New Guinea. And while it is the end of another year, um, we're looking forward uh, as an organization to re-engaging with all of you in the new year and looking at what we can do to ensure we bridge this integrity gap. So thank you once again for your attendance. Uh, for those that are here in person, we do have a cocktail reception that will take place this evening from 6.30 onwards, where we will be presenting the awards of the Investigative Journalism uh, Award and the Integrity Initiatives of Excellence Awards. So we invite you to join us for that reception here at APEC House. Uh, with that, again, I thank you all, uh, and we look forward to working with you all.
when I was um, speaking, I referred to um, afternoon tea as morning tea, and today I've completely forgotten afternoon tea. But there is afternoon tea outside, and I'm told that uh, we'd like to take a group photo outside with everyone that's here in the room as well. And the ME forms, please ensure you hand in your ME forms to the registration desk. 